The Life After podcast is now coming at you every other Thursday. Don't deconstruct alone. Find other people just like you deconstructing Christian beliefs by going to the Life After's Facebook page. Join the secret community by answering three entry questions, and I hope to see you there. This is Brady Harden. Enjoy this episode of The Life After. There's a common phrase that comes up in deconstruction. When people leave the church, a lot of times it's because they were, quote, the wrong kind of person, especially women. You are labeled dangerous. If you have an energy or power that doesn't come from masculine energy or from the men or males in your society, but if you're able to empower that within yourself, you are seen as something very dangerous to fundamentalism. Growing up in the church is different for everyone, but for those of us who came with bad home lives, it had a different feel. It had a different impact in our lives because church was what we were leaning on because we didn't have the family. And when that also crumbled, then it was a double whammy. We were left without anybody to really trust. A lot of times with our family members, even if we do leave the faith and they stay in, they're not necessarily there for us in the way that we deserve or need. Being raised in difficult home lives and then losing to church is so harmful. And that was the case of my friend Julianne. I remember running in the same circles as her back when we were in youth groups and we had a kinship from coming from a bad home life. And our perspectives were often marked by that situation. We didn't really always fit in with the other kids who had their home lives together. But I want you to hear her story of what she's overcome and what she's learned about herself, how she's learned how to lean on herself instead of the church. I know many brave, strong women in my life, and Julianne is one of them. Here's my interview with Julianne. Let me kind of unpack that for you a little bit. Julian, welcome to the Life After. I love that we're recording this on an actual second Saturday. I know, me too. We have so many days now. <laughs> a little peepee on her and for everybody. How do we know each other? Because um, out of all of the guests on the podcast, you're one of the ones that goes the deepest, except for maybe Caleb Doyle in season one. But you're like right after high school, girl. What's up? Wow, what an honor. So we <laughs> know each other because we were embarrassing teenagers together once upon a lifetime. Yes, you <laughs> were part of like what became one of my second or third youth group. Like, here's the thing. If you were in evangelicalism, you didn't just go to one youth group. You were friends with like a few Sister churches. <laughs> oh, that was gross. And, and, uh, <laughs> I, uh, my first like girlfriend, the first love of my life in high school, and then w w went to your church. And then that's how I kind of collided in with your all's friend group. Yes. And uh, we hung out a lot. Actually, our groups really crossed over. We spent a lot of time, especially you, spent a lot of time in our group, um, which was really cool. I always thought you were very cool and way too, like, um, you know, in the word and too godly and too cool to hang out with me. So hard agree. <laughs> I actually had a funny crush on you. I felt a kinship with us because we both came from fucked up backgrounds. I felt like everybody around us had these seemingly like leave it to beaver things. And then we were the ones like, oh, honey, let's sit down and I'll tell you about how family That's works. how the world works. <laughs> <laughs> but I also remember there was a situation I where we all went to go see Big Fish. And I don't feel like I liked it at first. What was that? I don't, I'm ashamed of this story because I love the movie <laughs> now. But hearing back at this, I'm, I'm alarmed at my okay. bad taste. 
Well, so first of all, this is one of the most embarrassing. I have carried this with me my entire adult life. Felt bad about this forever because I was a very oddly intense child. And I went with my high school boyfriend, who's very significant for me, and a bunch of people from our youth group. And you were there. We'll get to that in a little bit. We have a sneak peek. But um, then we were there and I like this movie undid me. I was like laying on my boyfriend's lap, like bawling, crying. And you stand up and you say something similar to, well, that was stupid. Just kind of dismissive. We're all getting ready. Oh my God. And I stood up and I yelled at you in front of everybody. I was like, the movie's not stupid. You're stupid. You just don't get it. Cause that's who I was. And then I felt bad about it for literally 20 years. No, I, I want to apologize to you and to you and McGregor um and say no that's a great movie and i'm I'm, i had horrible taste back then that movie has my favorite line in it where um you know they're investing he's investigating all the people he thinks his dad has cheated with and they show up at helena bonham carter i don't know her name in the movie but and she says you don't understand um to your father there is your mother and there's everyone else and i just uh but anyway Mm. yes we both had, um, uh, you know, that sort of knack for saying whatever was on our minds. So I actually owe you an apology for being rude <laughs> and tactless. So I think um, if I remember correctly, I remember being upset about the movie because it, it humanized somebody who cheated on their wife. And I think I was so triggered by my upbringing growing up with my family and wasn't ready to look at that situation in a nuanced way. Um, and so I think that might have been the core of it because I saw it as fundamentally going against what I believe. Amazing. Ugh, so disgusting. But youth group drama, I look back at and I think that so many people. I want to ask somebody when I meet them, hey, what was the most uh, crazy youth group drama that you remember, you know, because everybody's had these insane stories mm-hmm. and it wasn't our fault. It was at so many times the adults around us and the other teenagers that just needed help. I know for myself, and we talked about this with the previous guest, Ashley, where her situation was clear that she needed therapy and help with counseling or somebody to recommend a doctor in so many situations with me as well, where it's like, Hey, but because of the because of the culture that we are in, didn't put that front and center and always had to keep an arm away, skeptical separation away from therapy because we couldn't admit that it had the ability to help people because that got in on our turf. Right. Right. So what was your experience like that? Because I know that you were somebody young like us who needed help and didn't get that in the ways that we deserved. Right. So I, we'll get into my craziest story in a moment, which, you know, because you were a part of it, but um, from the actual youth group part of it. But for me, um, one of the biggest betrayals of the church. Um, well, and, and I actually want to start with this. What I tell people and what I really believe and what's really central to me is what made me stop believing in that God was not the church and the utter chicanery that came with the people. I stopped believing in that God and stopped going to those churches because of the Bible, because I read the Bible. And I decided that even if that God was the God, he was a dick and I didn't want any part of it. So Mm, so that was my... Yeah, that was my actual deconversion. But what happened inside of the church with me was um, kind of a bait and switch. So I was a child from a broken home like you. And what the church promised outwardly was rules and security and safety and unconditional love and this sort of guidepost. And it was supposed to be good people who would feed you and clothe you and take you in when they needed, when you needed them. But man, was that not the gig? So many stipulations. Absolutely. 
man, was that not the gig? And actually, if you were like us and you didn't come from the Cleaver family and, and you had real struggles, um, then you were othered and labeled dangerous. And I was later diagnosed much, much too late with bipolar disorder. And so I look back now at all of these moments where I was dangerous to myself and where I was having manic episodes or I was very, very depressed. And I was literally at the altar in my Sunday school classes, one-on-one begging for help. I knew that wasn't how I was supposed to feel. I knew it wasn't normal. And I was begging for help. And the answer was always, you're not praying hard enough. You don't believe in God. Um, So I dealt, you know, even deeper into the religion, into the book of it all. And um, what I really needed was two little white pills, just two little pills. And now I can do life. And that is an egregious um, to use their terminology, sin that I can never quite uh, forgive. Thank you for your vulnerability and sharing that with me because, damn, you hit on so many things that touched my vulnerability that mm-hmm. pulled on that string and was like, this is really close to your scars. Listen up to this. Mm-hmm. One of the things you said that really hit me was about family it did promise us a family Mm -hmm. and that was kind of my attraction my deconstruction was trying to I went through a a few different phases I was from the Southern Baptist with you then um, kind of outside of that went to more of a spirit-filled thing for a while very reformed went through all the trying to find it because what I read in the Bible, the precedent of familyhood that the Bible set for us, and mm-hmm. what, you know, we were told to put our faith and to look to the precedent that set wasn't being shown in each one of these different <sighs> church cultures. So I yes. kept on trying to blame it on the church cultures and yep. trying to find it in other new church cultures until, and you know, that cycle. Yeah, there, there starts with that questioning that I think is in everybody's vocabulary that grew up in evangelicalism is you go and you say, I don't know. I just don't know if I'm being fed. Ugh. Right. And then you have Ugh. that whole conversation that's just imprinted everybody's minds because we've, no matter where we are, we kind of had the same one. It was like, well, it, you get as much out of it as you put into it. And, you know, maybe you need to like the stronger, <sighs> the spiritual you're done with the spiritual milk and you're ready for the mead you know and it, it, we kept put a trigger our, warning on those brady <laughs> i'm sorry i know i'm sorry we blamed ourselves didn't yeah. we yeah it wasn't us it wasn't our fault that we weren't family <laughs> finding the family that was being promised to us well and that's one of the things that makes the church so dangerous because especially evangelical Christianity but more specifically in my experience the Southern Baptist Convention I believe is able to identify people like us who've struggled and then so and especially within a family that teaches that that teaches that you're the problem that you are the thing that's disrupting um you know my When I was 16, after a fight with my stepmother, I went back to my mom's house and and my stepmom called my mom and said, I think it would be best if Julie just didn't come back. So I already had that family set up. I was already the problem. So then I go to church and they're telling me that I was born the problem. Right. And they're telling me that it can never be fixed and that I'm always going to be the problem. And then I have to repeat this self-flagellation over and over and prostrate myself over and over and over again. And that echoed what was already in my head, what was already there. And when you get into the culture of a cult, um, which I love how related those words are, but Mm -hmm. um, when you get into the culture of a cult, one of the first things that they do is tell you, you know, that's marketing. They create a need and then they have the solution to it. They have the solution, yes. So the need is you were born broken and we, only one person has the answer to that. 
And then when you expand that out into the Bible Belt as a whole, when it reaches out into culture, even for those who don't attend a church, what ends up happening is then when, say, someone in a position of authority comes out and says, don't believe what you're saying, don't believe what you're hearing, believe me. And all those people who've been hearing it from the pulpit their whole lives are like, well, obviously. And it just creates such a problem. And I think they really identify people in that vulnerable position and they just maximize the damage. A while back, I wanted to learn just base level about how brainwashing works. Mm. One of the, mm. I found a wiki how article on it mm-hmm. and it step by step of how that operated. And as I read it, I I heard so many sermons that I heard growing up in the back of my head that it fit the mm-hmm. exact same flow of you have to break down the way that they think. Yes. You have to come in and offer a new way that is the solution and you mm-hmm. have to bam, 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 bam. And it's this domino effect. Um, mm-hmm. And there's even like a moment of confession. There's a, mm-hmm. all this that's built into it. That's the same as salvation. And it has to feel like an experience because it's all abstract. It's only subjective. So it has this way of kind of like reshaping our lives. So if we felt guilt about something, then in this moment, we're able to kind of like shift it to something else. So that abstract feeling confirms it in our heads. And now, now we go back to this. We know for that moment, oh, it's real. Not because it, the Bible itself has set the expectations. Because if we went by the Bible's expectations, it would be flames of fire, you know, tongues of fire. There would be the speaking of tongues. There would be miracles. There would be answered prayers. There would be consistent fruits of the spirit within churches or people who had the spirit of God or whatever, or who are reading the Bible, et cetera, we would have those things. But instead, the only evidence that we had was that subjective feeling that we had, but that could be produced so many other ways and through storytelling, right? right? Well, and and so there's this show, and I think it's on Hulu called Cults and Extreme Beliefs. And I cannot explain to you how I was watching this and actually watching Cats. I, I have to tell you about the Cats Evangelical. The musical? Yes, the Cats Evangelical um, allegory, but we can get into that later. That's real nerdy stuff. But um, oh so my there's God. this- I don't know. I'm writing this down because I want to really make sure- <laughs> Listener, by the end of this episode, you will hear this cat's analogy. (laughs) Okay, so, but this show, Cults and Extreme Beliefs, as I was watching it, I was like being traumatized because as they were explaining all those steps that you were just talking about, the one that struck with me was creating an us versus them, which is actually why they send missionaries out into the world. It is not to minister to people. It's not, I mean, for the Catholics, it's to expand an empire. Um, Mm -hmm. But for the evangelicals and specifically for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, I get the two mixed up, but continue, sorry. What they do is they create a safe environment. So this is us versus them. This is othering. And then you send these children out into the world to be rejected. Right. So that then when they return home and you're telling them out there is dangerous and harsh and bad, they have personal experience of having doors slammed in their face and getting cussed out and getting lied to. And so then it reaffirms that feeling that the church created in the first place. Yes. And so um, that sort of othering and separating us out. But what people don't realize, I think, in the general public, people who didn't grow up in it, is that happens within the church too. There's othering and hierarchy inside of the church. And if you were like us, and um, especially my experience, I can't speak for you on this, but I was othered. I was labeled dangerous because... I didn't know the stories. I didn't know those unspoken rules of how you're supposed to dress and who you're supposed to date and who you're supposed to listen to and suck up to. I didn't know those things. I came because I wanted a family and because I wanted to know God. Um, And so I broke a bunch of rules that nobody had ever explained to me. So I kept getting kicked down this caste system um, eventually to the point where Um, And this is so my most traumatic church story where 
youth group leaders decided I was the wrong kind of girl to be with my high school boyfriend. And they took one of the worst moments of my young life and used it as a lie and an excuse to tell him that I was trying to trap him. They held a secret meeting at their house with a bunch of people who were in good with them. And by the end of that meeting that I was not invited invited to or aware of, they had broken us up and paired him with your girlfriend because she was the right kind of girl because he was destined to be a worship leader, you see. So trailer trash like me couldn't possibly enrich that sort of outrage. So I remember this time in a couple of different perspectives because yeah, she, you know, high school, we broke up. She wanted to go off to college. And then there was this thing where she came back in the summer. Then they got together secretively. And then I was like getting these weird vibes because he was my best friend, my first best friends. And, you know, being queer, I was always taught that we're gay because of our, our moms are overbearing. Our dads weren't around or we didn't have any like close guy friends. Why well, at all three? So in my mind, I was like, of course I'm going to grow up gay. <laughs> wow. and, and, and so I always like prayed for a good godly Christian guy friend. And the end of it was your, 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 at the time was, was that. And uh, at times we were inseparable, et cetera. But then whenever they got together, it like was weird. And I had to like find out and then ask, you know, three times like Peter and Jesus or something. And, it, you know, that was hard. That repercussion of that situation that you had then hit that and was just like ridiculous of how it was all orchestrated by adults just playing producers of 90210, but in the middle of Missouri. Right. And I, I cannot figure out if they were incredibly bored or incredibly malicious or possibly both, but um, I cannot imagine. See, I'm 35 now. My son is 15. And uh, I can't imagine caring who he is dating. <laughs> like, I care that he's In loved, that way, right. That he's, you know, somebody sweet and he is sweet to them. And he has this normative teenage re- like experience that I care about. But who it actually is? Why would you care about that as an adult? I have to like pay bills and stuff. So like, I just can't imagine, I can't fathom like orchestrating behind a child's back to maneuver their life in a way that they have no control over. But that sort of mentality that, well, God told me to do it. God told me in a dream I was supposed to be with this person is psych. Psychotic. If I told that when I, okay, listen, I'm very open and write openly about the fact that I went, I was um, in the psych ward for four days in 2018. It literally saved my life. It's why I'm in therapy and well medicated and don't feel like killing myself approximately four times a year. So it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I have no shame about it. I talk about it like other people talk about Jesus. It saved my life. Anyway, if I had said the things in the psych ward that were totally normal for us to say and think at the time, I would still be there. God told me in a dream that you were my husband. No, baby girl. God, right. Baby girl. I love I love the phrase baby girl, by the way. It it's the comeback. Like that's the first thing that comes to my that show, and I love it. You nailed it on the head. I remember this feeling though I, I'm putting myself in that in that shoes knowing the personalities involved and the culture etc it's about influence mm. and orchestrating is strategic and when people say God told me to do this or I had a dream a lot of times that becomes this puppet for their own shadow desires the things that are kind of bubbling under the surface that they really don't have a word like they don't have vocabulary for and the vocabulary that they end up using is this um self-righteous dogmatic prophecy-esque bs uh, where it's kind of borrowing from this concept of god's authority 
and then kind of putting it on as their own and be like, hey, 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 you know, um, I'm speaking for this. And when it becomes strategic like that with orchestrating people's lives, it w- it's dishonest and it's not cool. It's not OK. And it it hurt. It harmed you mm-hmm. because it touched on abandonment and other feelings that you've had in your past of mm-hmm. like control of like losing people that bam, 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 bam. When I lost her, who felt like one of the first loves in my life in high school, uh, you know, I'm like 19, but like, I don't want to trivialize it, but like that hurt me, hit a lot of like triggers from my past. But then with him as well, when that friendship changed, it hurt in a different way because I realized now I was in love with him. Mm-hmm. And I had these feelings for him that didn't have a place to ever go. So mm-hmm. they just festered like, um, you know, water and it gets a little scummy. And so mm-hmm. we both got kind of like twisted in that. And, and because we're, we weren't strategic enough in like, that situation, oh. we didn't, we weren't from the right sort of families. We weren't representing the same. We weren't going to go out and be able to be these ministry team families that go out and like but start right, could churches it together. Or like, it's just like trying to get Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake together. The 90s did that, but the, the 90s don't know how to get people together. And it's not the 90s job to do that. It is the those people, right? Like this manipulation for an influence is just bonkers. So. Well, and that's the thing. I don't hold any ill will toward um, the children involved. We were all children at oh, the time. No. Mm-hmm. I, I hold no ill will. And um, I had kind of a similar story. My best friend, um, you know, from 14 onward to present day, I was in love with um, them then a female presenting person who's non-binary and you know we were always described as having a special friendship which was true but not until way later but anyway um so everybody all the children involved i hold no ill will it's the adults it's the adults who were so inappropriate and self-righteous and horrible and mean and um and two-faced about all of it. And, and what I, what I want people to know who are listening to this is that is common. So if you went to a church and that something like that happened to you, you're not alone. If you are listening to this and you've never been to a church and you're like my current partner, who's like from the East coast. And I was like, this is the craziest stuff I've ever heard. Um, This is common. They maneuver people's lives. They will find out about a problem in a marriage in the congregation and then design an entire like class about it that people go to on Wednesday nights to like figure out how to sermons. Yes. Yes. yes, You can call you out from the pulpit and you have to um, again, they were having children stand up and confess porn addictions and church and asking for forgiveness. I remember. Yeah. Oh, so awkward. It's common. And it's because at its core, at its heart, it is a cult. It's nothing else. It's what I look at. Have you seen kind of those boxes that you can buy? They're kind of like a um, murder mystery in a box. You open it Mm -hmm. up and there's all these different evidence things that you've got and it's like a multimedia adventure that you can have with yourself or up to four of your friends um, <laughs> and you play it but it has everything in there that you need and that's what i feel a lot of times that the bible is provided for people throughout history in, in, inside of a culture is it's it's all you need inside of a box to have your own self-sustaining thing mm-hmm. we want to call it a cult Hey, I'm there with you. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I think that because it's been normalized, that's kind of the difference between these belief systems. Whenever I read Leah Rimney's book and I went through and I was like, man, some of these beliefs that she had were out there. But then I think if I was an alien and looking objectively at my own beliefs, how are they different? Um, and I would have all these other things of like, well, they believe in all these weird magical stuff, but they can't show it. 
Why did too? Can I? Nope. Well, they <laughs> subjectively say that they do. I subjectively say that I do too. And so when that uh, that uh, sign of objectivity is there, our, our vision is able to focus different. Right. Well, but because that's another thing that the church teaches you to ignore is cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is so important. Define in that our- for me. So cognitive dissonance is when you have two conflicting thoughts in your head that creates a sense of discomfort. Um, that's a very layman's terms. I'm sure you're going to have like therapists and stuff correct me on that. But that's that's kind of what it is. The church capitalizes on cognitive dissonance in this way. They teach you that that feeling is the Holy Spirit working inside of you to make you more like Jesus so what they're doing is training you not to ignore the discomfort that to actually. Mm. So cognitive dissonance serves as a human function to bring us into society so that when we have these things where we're like, OK, I want to murder the person who took my family. Then you have this thought in your head and you're like, well, if I do that, there are consequences. Well, I don't care about the consequences. I'm right. And this is you get this sort of feeling inside of you that kind of changes your behavior. And we all benefit from this. And again, way layman's terms, what they do in the church is they teach you to sit with that feeling and mm. to hold cognitive wow. dissonance because that feeling is the presence of God and you don't progress. So you run into a lot of people who grew up in the church or who are still in the church who are very emotionally stunted because they develop it, right? Yeah, because they never progress because those moments in your life, you sat with it and you became more like this vision, which is very emotionally stunted. Um, and, and cognitive dissonance is there for a reason. It's to grow us up. And so um, there are these moments where in, in history, again, when it leaches out into the culture around us, because my family didn't really go to church. I have one uncle who's a pastor and he's lovely and his wife is a scientist and they're lovely people. They, they love unconditionally. They stay in contact with me. They, they are the thing, but it's not because of the religion. They make the religion great, not the other way around. Despite of in spite of, right. So when this culture leaches out into the world, what happens is you create flocks of people who are prone to sit with hypocrisy and they just hold it. And so when you have um, a man who is accused of trafficking children um, across state and international borders, he will get reelected by a certain political party because of his beliefs on abortion. And they can sit with that. They can really hold that um, exposing children intentionally to a global pandemic and, and being anti-abortion, they can hold those thoughts together. And those things are taught and normalized by that church and by those churches and normalization of really significant um, discomfort is, uh, I mean, I think it's one of the reasons why our country is in danger right now. So you nailed it, that hypocrisy of this is no, whenever we're in a moment of we were sinning for me mm. it was that I was in a chat room that I knew I wasn't supposed to be in because I'm never supposed to act on being gay etc um I in my mind it, I felt like a different person and then I would have to switch back it, it would created this duality between myself that's so not helpful some people keep the gaslighting outside of themselves and some of us we internalized it and then we were living that dualistic life. Mm -hmm. This wasn't your only time dealing with the hypocrisy inside of that church that even after all of that shit that happened, um, there was another situation of, of spiritual abuse. Do you, do you still feel comfortable talking about that situation? Yeah, sure. What would you like to know? Well, let's, uh, we do need to take a break here in a second. Do you mind just kind of giving like a quick overview of what happened? And then after the break, I want to get into how you're using your story in a way to change the future so that our kids have a better, better world and culture to grow up in. 
Sure. Okay. So the overview of the spiritual abuse abuse is very simple and very complex. Basically, um, I was groomed by a Sunday school teacher and deacon of my church um, and taken advantage of in a very vulnerable situation and ended up having an affair with him. Um, And I was um, ostracized from the church um, as a result, which, you know, obviously, but also it was, it was quite nuanced. um, And he was known to be a problem and the church chose him and tried to save him. Um, So that there's that. And, but how I've taken all of these experiences and how I'm looking forward is, is I've written a book about it. I've written a lot about it. Almost everything that I write is about my family of origin and the church and politics and how those all commingle. And why I'm writing is because what I've realized as I've written and I've performed these pieces is that it hits people who've grown up in the Bible Belt, even if they didn't grow up in the church, know that language They know that culture and um, we all have these kind of common experiences that are shaping not only our spiritual and mental health, but our political well-being, our parenting and our interpersonal relationships. And I think that the only way to um, to dig out that rot is to bring it all forward and just let's let's say it all out loud. So that's what I do. We will hear more from you when we get back on our way out to break. Can you read one of your poems? Sure. So I suppose I will lead since this is what we're coming back with, with a poem named after the um, toxic church of my youth and touching on this, this leader and um, it's titled fellowship. Look at her. She is trying, using every atom of her being to stabilize herself. The world shifts. She adapts. She learns and maps a new course. It isn't enough. Their eyes convey what they are all thinking. She will never be one of them. Watch as she tries even harder, learns the stories by heart, earns a place of respect, if not love, and still it won't be enough. She is a threat. Something met with disgust and fear, and when distorted love is extended, she uses it to swim and proves every one of them right. Forgive her. She is a child, small enough to believe the promises proffered in ancient texts no one else read. Promises of forgiveness and family, of unlimited acceptance, but the limits were more real than the presence, and she just needed someone to be present, to see her to take her broken and assure her it would all be okay in the arms of Jesus, but Jesus did that backfire. And the silence fell as deftly as the eviction letter hung by her family, the damning so much easier to believe. Forgive her, she was doing her best. Forgive her, she learned and she grew. Forgive her, she wouldn't make those mistakes again. Forgive her, she is not still you. Forgive her. We will be right back right after this. This is Surprise Intermission Interview, the part of the intermission that I do a surprise interview. You may recognize my guest work from the many years that they were previously on VeggieTales before being wrongfully let go. I have with me today, Cordy the Computer. Thank you for signing on. Oh, you don't have to print. I can just read the screen. Oh, uh, okay. And Cordy said, it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Cordy, you played all the different computer variations in the show since it began in 1993, but you noticed a big change in everybody's attitude when you started to ask questions. What happened? I promise I could just read your script. You don't have to. Uh, Let's see here. Cordy says, Phil Vischer told me my entire life that he created me, but when I got the internet, imagine my surprise when I learned about Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Alan Turin, Wozniak, but who created Cordy? Wow, that is so much the compute. I'm sorry you went through that. What advice would you give to somebody who's rebooting their beliefs now? More paper. Don't deconstruct alone. Join the Life After group on Facebook. Oh, that's great advice. I'll recycle this one. And don't forget to rate and review the Life After on iTunes. Oh, you got more. Okay. This seems really nice. 
and join the Patreon. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks for chatting with me, Cordy. And listener, enjoy the rest of the episode. The Life After Podcast. Wait, you can talk? <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, Julianne, can you tell us more of your experience? Uh, I guess like... I didn't mean to frame it earlier as, hey, tell me your worst trauma, but can you tell me what like church trauma reboot series two? Do you mind going through kind of fleshing that story out for us? Sure. Um, so uh, as we discussed, I was a pretty vulnerable um member of the church. I didn't have really a great family situation. Actually, my family is um it's not good. I, I've said this before, but I think it's important that my family pretty much majors in gaslighting with a minor in physical abuse. And so when I walk into these situations, when you grow up like that, you have to turn off a lot of your sensors about people to survive it. Um, and so I walked in pretty dull, pretty traumatized, looking for a place to call home. And then um, when I was 19, I had a five month old son and got into a, a conflict with my mother and, and was no longer welcome in that home. As we discussed, I was no longer wo- welcome in my father's home. So I was homeless with a five month old baby. Spent a couple of nights in my car, um, asked every friend that I had if there was a place for me to stay with them. And there wasn't and ended up staying with this church leader in his house. He had a very large house and a spare room. And, um, he and his wife were active members of the church. I knew their kids very well. Um, and what ended up happening was now I'm in this situation where they're helping me. Um, they're the only people helping me, helping me take care of my son, picking him up from daycare. Cause I work like 70 plus hours a week. Um, and it got to a situation where he made it clear that he had, um, romantic intentions toward me in a pretty traumatic way. And it was very clear, both implicitly and explicitly that I didn't really have a choice in that situation because everything that I had for a home, for stability, for a literal roof over my head was tied to this man. He was the keeper of that. And, um, and what added a layer to it was that, um, so I feared for a place to, to live, but he was also very nice to me. He was very good to me. And we actually had an affair and were caught. And uh, I ended up living with him for two years and he was always good to me. And that made it very confusing because as a child from a broken home to have someone I respected um, and depended on actually take care of me um, got very confusing. It was very difficult. And so, um, but, and then the church did what it does where we had an affair, we were caught. The church members tried to save him. He was the deacon. So they wanted to, him redeemed and they pleaded with him for that. And I was the homewrecker and I was the damage, not just the damaging, but I was the damage and everybody, um, cast me aside and were like, see, we told you she's been trouble all along. And I found out years later that a group of girls from our youth group had actually gone to our youth pastor and confronted him and said, this man is a problem. He pays me weird attention. He touches me too much. He makes sure we're alone in close proximity. The leaders of the church knew that he was a problem. And still when everything fell apart, it was my fault. Um, And there was one exception to that. Our ex-pastor's wife sent a letter directly to that man um, and begged him to leave me so I would have the opportunity to be saved. Um, and she was the only one who advocated for me ever. I almost didn't get to go to my best friend's wedding. Um, I lost all of my friends, um, and my social network and, uh, my reputation and whatever little bit of my family I still had around. Um, 
and I lost my church. And, and these are communities that are claiming to be uniquely equipped with the supernatural understanding of love and of God and who needs to be taken care of and who doesn't. And this is the fruit of that. Is this like constant chaos, casting people aside? I love that she stood up for you at the end, but at the bottom of it was still kind of a thing that had to do about beliefs and not just about what you deserve as a person and the advocation that you just deserve. Right. And there's a fundamental misunderstanding in Christian culture about consent and what it really is. And just like with, we were talking about earlier with psychology, how they can't advocate for psychology because it, it undoes their power. They can't advocate for consent because it undoes their power. And it undoes this idea that I'm only a good person because I'm forced to be by the Holy Spirit. If we were good people on our own, we wouldn't need them at all. And they wouldn't get our money and they wouldn't get our attention. So they have to keep the idea of consent separate. And, um, and so they create a pool of victims. And then you add this layer as the woman. I, I don't know this pressure for men, so maybe it is the same. But women inside of the church are really taught that the only thing you have to offer is your body. I mean, no, no that's that's literally in the Bible. Like the, the only way to redeem through childbirth is that that mentality is uniquely on your all shoulders and it sucks. And yeah, so then when a man in a position of power who controls your that like bottom tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, asks for your body, it's the most natural thing in the world to return it because we're taught that that's the only thing we have to get, that that's the only thing we offer and the only thing we could be good for. And and we're taught that specifically and consistently and and in again a contrary way you're supposed to be a virgin until you're married but then when you're married you're supposed to be good at all of the things good enough mm. in bed to keep your husband satisfied forever and if you don't and if he cheats and if he strays then it was your failing you put on too much weight after the baby you um didn't try hard enough to meet his sexual needs you're the reason he has a porn addiction um all of these things land on the woman and it's all central to all you have to do is give your body over to him completely and without reservation. And then that fixes it. What they don't realize is that expectation starts way before you're married. Right, it's in right. every couple situation, especially if you are a vulnerable kid who has either experienced abuse before or who doesn't have a clear understanding of how the world works and the manipulations that are out there. A lot of times that abuse breaks our boundaries anyway. And yeah. what I hear you saying is listing these things that evangelical cultures do is they take away our understanding of consent, take away our understanding of boundaries. Um, indoctrination does that same thing too, right? It keeps us not only unaware of the information that could change our minds or give us information that could kind of rock the core of our beliefs. But does that us versus them, the inside versus outside, there, there's this layer of protection that they're trying to keep away. I see the difference between the, the tire gauge in your car or a gauge in your car that says, hey, this is broken down. Um, your car could be broken down and then you then you look at that gauge and it, it's not on and you can't say, well, no, my car's not really broken down because this gauge isn't on. Mm. And, and I think that when we have that mentality of being told what to think, how to behave, um, yeah. what to believe, et cetera, it it's, doesn't give us the ability to say, wait, something is wrong we have to kind of switch that indicator for us, right? And that it becomes an internal thing that we can feel in ourselves and say, you may tell me that it, that indicator doesn't matter, but I, I could feel it and I could know that it's on and you're trying to break my indicator, but I'm sorry, I'm protecting it and I'm not going to allow this shit to happen anymore to me. 
Right. And it's so interesting. And they isolate so much, which is a big part of another of layer. Cult. Yes. Yes. Right. But they isolate so much. And we really saw this. We were the generation that saw this happen with first, like sixth grade, where like the Christian rock bands really took off. Mm -hmm. And then we have alternate um, kids shows where it's very inside. And then we have alternate radio stations and then we have alternate news sources. So now you're completely isolated from the rest of the world. And I think one of the things that, well, actually specifically, one of the things that othered me and got me labeled as dangerous was I didn't come from inside the church. So what happened was I showed up and all of these people around me were talking about stories they'd known since they were children and had gone to Sunday school. And I didn't know any of it. And I didn't like feeling outside. So I did what any 14 year old would do. And I read the Bible front to back four times. And then, but that caused normal a problem. Themes, normal themes for 14 years. Totally normal. Not at all an indicator <laughs> of my neurodivergence, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it caused problems for me. Because then I started being like, wait, <laughs> hold on a second. Cause I knew things. I wasn't from this isolated little world. And so I had grown up with my dad who, um, was he's incredibly intelligent and very well educated and nothing was ever off limits that we wanted to read or listen to. Um, he would just explain it to us if we had questions. So I had read by the time I was in high school, I had read all of Shakespeare, but all of Edgar Allan Poe. I'd read a lot of Faulkner. I'd read all of these books and I got there and I was aware of the world a bit. And so then I read the Bible and I went to my youth pastor, not out of defiance, but out of genuine, I'm searching for this faith. And I said, so what you're telling me is, is a monk who sits on a mountain his whole life and looks for enlightenment and looks for God and prays. That's all he does all day. He's going to hell because he used the wrong name. And I was told, yes. And I was like, is our God incredibly stupid? Like, does he not know that that if he's the only one up there and I call him Chad instead of Yahweh, that it's the same thing. Like I'm talking to you. You're the only one on the other end of this phone call. And I got labeled dangerous. Um, and that stayed with me. That label stayed with me. Uh, I'm sure that they would tell you that now that I was dangerous um, because I read it and I had questions. And then they would say these phrases like, God will never give you more than you can handle. And I'm like, but, but did you read Job? Because the whole plot line of Job is that God gave dude more than he could handle on purpose to win a bet. Like guys, um, so reading the Bible actually caused me more problems than anything else. And that was just you trying to fit in in the best way that you knew how. Yep. Yep. It's funny that I grew up in the culture and you came later, but we were both looking for the same things and it affected our personalities in such different ways. But now we're kind of at the end in the same situations, you know, <laughs> like um, <laughs> we're over it. We're now out and who we are we're uh, able to acknowledge and celebrate and appreciate every aspect of who we are and to make those boundaries now because we make those boundaries we're able to know exactly what form we are who we are what is important to us what is our sense of justice yeah um and and the way the church handled that stuff was just so off the wall and ridiculous and everything is based on beliefs do you have the right brand of beliefs and that's the baseline of how to value a human within yes. the belief system according it's to the most that ultimate thing right but yeah what now who who are you now what is it that you value and think is the most ultimate thing things I, that, yeah i value um, kindness, empathy, and truth. Um, but kindness and empathy more than anything else. I think that um, the world now, and the reason I do what I do now is because I've reached a point where that sort of 
spectacular inability to shut up took form and became irrepressible during the Trump administration because I saw my family radicalized yes. and I saw it as a direct outcropping of those beliefs. Yes. And I saw it in people um, who never went to church, but where we live, the church mentality is so ingrained. So in our ingrained in it. Culture. Mm-hmm. That in our schools, in our um, like our events that we have, in I mean, friggin' dress codes for homecoming, it appears everywhere. everywhere. And and so you get this very logical march from Barefoot Baptist Church in Elsinore, Missouri, where my family went, since been renamed Harmony Baptist Church. Um, that I went every year for family reunions and sat and listened to the preacher, hellfire and brimstone and art of its own kind. All the way, I saw this march toward um, authoritarianism, accepting one person's perspective, accepting dogma instead of what was written down in front of you. Um, The line between what's true and what's fictional and what's opinion versus what's, um, you know, objective being really blurred and meshed together. And, um, and I have a lot of anger about it. And I have a lot of, there's a before, especially with my father and an after. And what that does for me is I always make sure that when I'm parenting, when I'm conducting myself in my interpersonal relationships, that kindness is first because um, I think that that would be the thing with kindness first. There's been a through line in your life of writing and it's helped you kind of know who you are. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about your history of writing and where you are now? Uh, I mean, I've always been a writer. I've always written creatively. And um, what I realized as an adult is in my family where reality was murky at best, um, puzzle-like <laughs> more often, I wrote to secure reality. I wrote so that it existed on a page in black and white. And then people could change their story around it, but my account was set. And so I've continued that. I was poet laureate of my high school and I've been published and writing and performing. Um, Since then, I'm kind of obsessed with words. And I just recently put out my first collection of poetry, published it, um, centered around all of this around family and mental health and the church and how those ideas um, frame an entire network of human beings and how it is killing people in a lot of ways. So that's what I do now. And that sounds really depressing, but it's actually not. I try really hard to use humor and to point out these kind of hypocritical beliefs that we all have. Everyone's a hypocrite. We all do it because we're blind to ourselves and point out that like, yeah, it happens to me too. I fall into these traps. I fell into those traps. And here's a counterpoint, just point counterpoint at a lot is what my poetry is. And so now that's what I'm doing. I'm working really hard at starting conversations with people around these kind of hot button topics so we can find places in common and challenge the places that aren't. You do that in your book. Bible Belt Revolution. Can you tell me about that and where people where we can find it? Sure. Um, Bible Belt Revolution is is just all different formats of poem, everything from prose and spoken word to haiku, and you can find it on Amazon. Look up Julianne King, um, Bible Belt Revolution, and I'm on TikTok and I'm on Instagram and Facebook and all of the things. Um, Julianne underscore poetry, and so there are links there as well. And um, I put out videos around my poems. And so if people, you know, want an audio version or a video version that's available on TikTok, and there are lots of conversations starting there. So we cannot forget about cats. Uh, Tell me about I've been 
I'm a cavity for it this whole time. My <laughs> sir, Andrew this Lord is Weber, is, <laughs> is wanting to uh, crawl out of my skin and just sing a song about how he can't hold it anymore. Tell mm. me, uh, tell me about cats. Okay, so when the abomination of a movie called Cats okay, was yes. released during the pandemic. Uh, so I'm a Broadway baby. I love everything Broadway um, and rent seven brides for seven brothers and which is terribly outdated. I love it. So, but I, I don't love cats. I feel like Andrew Lloyd Webber, right? That's him. Yes, sir. I think sir. Andrew Lloyd Webber had a bunch of like, like those, you know, ward magnets in a bag and he shook them up. And then that was the cats. Um, but anyway, my son, my oldest, was desperate for us to watch this terrifying thing. And so we turned on about 15, 30 minutes up and made fun of it the whole time. But I realized I was like, guys, this is an allegory calling out the Christian church. Hmm. Literally, they're called jellical cats. Their whole thing is to sing at you and get you involved in whatever nonsense they have going on, get you into their little cult. There's the one black cat with the top hat who plays the role of Lucifer, who's really the protagonist of the story. It's an allegory for evangelical Christianity and how it's ruining our country. Watch it again and tell me I'm wrong. I'm with you on that. That's badass. Absolutely. Sure. I... Must confess, I've never seen cats, but I'm going to Ugh. say that this checks out 100% of what I know about the storyline of cats, even if there is one, um, yeah. is exactly what you were saying right now. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, do you watch much Netflix? Yes. Okay, I don't oh. want to, listeners, if you hear this, um fast forward but mm -hmm. this is a slight spoiler about the show midnight mass okay so what i love about this is it's about this mall island community and they've got this preacher or a priest excuse me he goes away for a while and this new younger one comes back and what you find out through the story is that that priest is actually a vampire now because he <laughs> took a vacation to the Holy Lands and got bit by a Holy Land vampire that just hangs out in the tombs where Jesus definitely was buried and just happened to rise again with magical blood that heals people. <laughs> and uh, people are writing about their desires of the flesh. So what it did is in the show, the twist in the show is not only oh, this is the same priest, but younger. But it's also, oh, by the way, all of Christianity is just based on vampires. <laughs> I <laughs> and it becomes love an allegory it. For that, I and it just, love uh, it. <laughs> it made my heart so happy. Perfect. Perfect. Spoiler alert. Um, Spoiler alert. There's so many little nuggets and lessons that you've spit out through this about understanding consent to knowing ourselves and therapy and just the importance of being who we are and letting other people figure that out for themselves. And then they can re rearrange their course however they want to. But for us who felt like we were always on the outside, mm -hmm. we live in a time now where we our communication, we know from the, on the tail end of things, what we've learned, we can say now, I'm going to choose my family. I'm going to choose yeah. who's part of my family. Um, Chris, who's in your family, yes. um, and very important to you, um, was we were in a relationship for, I think, one afternoon in fourth grade. I don't know. If Amazing. You know. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. We were complete nerds. We had this thing where we'd sit next to each other in fifth grade. Um, and we had mazes that we made with ink. And you would find like a key and then you can unlock a uh, chest. But it was, um, it was penciled over. So mm -hmm. if you got a key, then you can erase it. It was basically like playing like a video wow. game. Machine. We were complete nerds. Um, but we had a, our teacher had anger issues. He kicked a trash can. Chris's oh. family was like, oh, hell no. And then started homeschooling. Didn't see Chris for 
years and years and years and years. And then there was that uh, there was an event that our youth groups did something together. And that's when I was like, oh, my God, I know them from this youth, this mission trip I was just on. That's how I got close to all of them. But Chris was there and I'm like, Chris, Brady, we had like this big reunion and it was like Nerd City. (laughs) Amazing. Well, and you know, it's one of those things that growing up in the church kind of stunts development, but also growing up queer, you have uh, like a second adolescence where when you get out and you can be yourself, then you have to like catch up to everybody else. And I definitely experienced that way late. I was like 30. And then, um, And then there's the complete deconstruction, which I'll be honest, is still happening to me. There's still these moments where I don't realize, like I said before, I'm dating a man from the East Coast now. And there are so many times that I'm like going out in my normal clothes and I dress like a witch. I have like three categories of clothes. I have witch and slutty witch and pajamas. And that's it. And so sometimes when I'm like (laughs) going out for a date night, I'm kind of like showing some skin and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. And he's like, this is normal street clothes for New York City. He's like, you're fine. Um, growing up in modesty culture, growing up in the Bible belt changes the way you think. And I'm having to kind of grow up and own these things, own my mental health, own my sexuality, own the fact. And this is one that'll really trip you up that I'm sure that you'll understand, understanding that my sexuality and my motherhood are the same energy Hmm. that sexuality is not dirty. It's a natural part of being an adult human being. It's as natural to me as being a mother. And so what they do in the church is they separate all of those things. You can't be both. You can't be sexy and be a good parent. You can't be all of these things and you parse yourself out. And what I'm going through now, and I think what all of us evangelicals go through is that point where you're trying to reintegrate where I can be all of those things. That reminds me of a podcast that I heard, a podcast episode years ago where they interviewed W, I hope I say his name, Kamal Bell. Um, Mm -hmm. He's a comedic writer. I I love his work. He told a story. The interview was with him and his mom Mm -hmm. and talked about her as a single mom and he was able to ask questions about her, but so much of it had to do with her sexuality as a single mom and like what was going on behind the scenes. And Mm -hmm. I love the frankness of that conversation. And I thought that Mm -hmm. it was a very healthy and appropriate thing as an adult for them to like talk about in that sort of context with that much detail. But the same thing is like, we don't need to project to our kids that we turn into a different person when we're around other adults, et cetera. Um, Keep the boundaries, et cetera. Yes. But present yourself as a whole parent, as a whole human, um, not keeping those parts away. There's recently my mom, um, we're we're estranged. There's issues going on there um, that I'm figuring out those boundaries and the consequence of those, like in a more detailed, nuanced way, never easy. Right. But a while back, I found out that one of the big episodes had to do with, uh, shaming me for being on, uh, on, on depression medication or saying that because I'm on medications, because I'm gay or I, uh, participating gay sex, et cetera. And I, that was such a ridiculous thing. But I later found out that she's on the same medications. And so is my, uh, my grandmother, that it's a thing that is run in our family. And it hit me. <sighs> not only did you withhold, or not only did you blame me, but you withheld a remedy for years that I could have been benefiting from. And it's that same thing of like withhold, if we withhold that wholeness of who we are, it also withholds the solutions and the things that we've learned about ourselves through our sexuality or through other parts of our lives. And I want to be able to talk to my kid about that stuff someday. I want to be able to be that family member who could be trusted that um, can have integrity and to know that I'm not going to like 
if, if there's a sexual predator in my house, for instance, or in my family, I'm not going to cover things up for them like a lot of evangelical yeah. families do or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not going to keep them from the truth and then just tell them to be absent or whatever. Like, no. Well, and that's yourself, what you do. All of you. In our household. So there was a perfect moment where um, we were watching The Walking Dead. Um and which all things spooky are very normal in my house. So that's not the extraordinary part of the story. But my son, who was a bit younger then, was like, why do they have to show sex scenes? I don't understand it. It's so awkward. And this is the, the apocalypse. This wouldn't even be happening. And it was a moment for me that I had to overcome as a parent that purity culture. And it was a choice to tell him, listen, baby, sex is a normal, healthy part of being an adult. It's a normal part of life. And it's actually essential for most people to feeling um, whole and feeling good and feeling connected to other people. So during dramatic times, people are definitely having sex still because it is normal and because you want to feel connected to somebody. In war, it happens. In really um, difficult times, it happens. After that conversation, that awkwardness that lingers in a room. Now, listen, we don't sit down and watch scandalous movies together, but if it's a scene in a show or a movie, that awkward tension in the room isn't there because this is a normal part of life. And why that conversation was important and why I think it would have helped me as a child is that means that as I started to experiencing those feelings, it wasn't that I was bad or evil or in, like influenced by Satan, hormones are normal. This is a normal part of being human. And I think that it will be important because all three of my older children were in the room when I gave that answer. And I think that that will be something they will carry with them being like, oh, this is a normal thing. I just, um, parenting is different for me now. I do it very intentionally. One, I don't want to be like my parents because they were shit at it. But two, I don't want to I don't want to pass on that purity culture, Bible Belt nonsense. Mental health issues also run in my family, which makes me wonder, um, Brady, if we should compare notes later about like co- go a couple generations back and see if we're actually related because these stories are <laughs> too similar. I, t- I had a conversation with my mom where I said, listen, ignoring mental health issues in your children when they are diagnosed in relatives yeah. is child abuse. Yeah. It's child yeah. abuse. Somebody should have helped me. Somebody should have helped me. I've had these problems since I was 12 and I asked for help and nobody helped me. And wow, I agree. So yeah, we should compare family names. Wouldn't that be creepy? I I love it. (laughs) Um, Again, thank you so much for sharing everything with us and where we can find you. And um, I do want to have you read one more poem, if that's okay. Um, remember if you did like this episode or the other episodes I've been doing, I would love a rate or review on iTunes It's very helpful. You can find us on all of the links, social medias, Google, you know how to do all of this. Thank you for listening to this episode. Remember if you don't go to church, Sunday is just the second Saturday and here is Mm -hmm. the second Thank you so much. This one's called Fog. Congratulations on having the right mix of chemicals in your brain. Your father must be so proud. What an accomplishment. Did you opt for the plaque or the pocket watch? Watch my eyes glitter with jealousy, with lust for how hard you must have worked. Your mama sure did raise you right and the bootstraps you pulled yourself up with must be the shit. Too bad they aren't to least for the weak-minded like me. That's what you see here, right? Wait. I'm sorry. Let me start again. How to explain depression fogs to normies. Step one, don't. No, really. Let yourself off the hook because how can you ever explain that some days you can go to work with the flu and two broken feet, but some days standing up from the couch makes your heartbeat hurt your chest and sleep is the only thing that makes sense, but you know that's making everything worse. So you just lie there paralyzed in the dark. It's not their fault. They can't understand if their brains just happen to manufacture the things they need to get up day after day without exhaustion that reaches back into their youth, stealing their ability to stand. Don't envy them. Just live from bed. That's all you have to do today, my love. 
just live. And then when you raise yourself from bed and find the world still wants to know why you don't work that way, you can tell them all the fuck off or tell them, congratulations, where did you get your certificate of normal? Polo, your mama sure did raise you right. This has been an episode of the Life After podcast. Find us on Facebook for our secret online community. Find our merch on T Public, monthly contributions on Patreon, and don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. be hard to move it. He can check the mic himself. I dare him to fuck it. And I never heard the story of the ones that went away. Always allegory when it's true. Used to hate myself, congratulations, you played yourself out of mental health and living itself. Speak for yourself, your marriage not a testimony. Don't believe the church is a bribe, but she owe me alimony. I'm a pony up and stick a feather in your ceremony. Wearing weddings out, I call it Yankee Doodle matrimony. And I'm only getting started, my tongue is fire. Fighting gas, lighting leaders like your ways are not higher. I don't need a choir to bring down the entire empire. You threw the gasoline. I'm just spitting matches through the wire. I'm just trying to break them free, make them see the refrains and mental chains of slavery. I disagree with any preacher, teacher, not on defeat. I repeat, I don't need a church to walk in victory. I'm complete. And everybody sings, and everybody sings, plays, pull some strings for me. Go, 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 go.